Good morning. I welcome you all on this auspicious occasion of Founders Day celebration. We are really privileged to have esteemed guest with us, uh, respected Professor Shekhar Mande, sir, uh, former Director General, CSIR, Secretary, DSIR, Director, NCCS, and now distinguished professor at uh, Savitri Bai Phule Pune University, uh, Dr. Premnath, who's Director of Venture Center, our own beloved Padma Vibhushan Kakodkar sir, who requires, who needs no introduction. Uh, staff and students, both past and present, invited guests, and my dear friends. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you today. The reason for that is our institute, Agharka Research Institute, has completed 76 years of its existence. Today we will be celebrating 77th Founders Day, uh, that is the birthday of our founder director, Professor S.P. Agharkar or Shankar Purushottam Agharkar. We are really indeed privileged that this institute is flourishing under the guidance of our life members of MSCS, office bearers of MSCS who are all present here and also the scientists who are contributing immensely to the growth of this particular institute. Since this institute has been in existence for 77 years, or 76 years, and we have now entered into 77th years, it would be really right to take a look at what exactly led to establishment of this institute, and what were the situation, what demanded the establishment of this institute. In short, what exactly is the story behind this institute that we are so proud of today? And that is something that I would like to discuss with you. The institute, came into existence in 1946. Those days, or early 1940s, were totally a different era, I would say. Uh, the Second World War was over, Germany was defeated, the black cloud of Second World War had already blown away. The Great Britain was not so great anymore. They, it had become weakened. Uh, the Quit India movement was at its peak, and India, it was inevitable that we would be getting our freedom. But it was during this period that there were thinkers, philosophers, scientists who had started thinking about what's going to be next. As soon as we get India independent, then what exactly are we going to do to make this India Saksham Bharat or Sashakta Bharat or Balashali Bharat? Everybody knew about the proud history of India. We knew that India was one of the strongest nation, one of the richest nation, one of the most intellectual nation. But newly independent India would not be like that. We were not so healthy nation, figuratively and literally. We were a nation which was not so literate anymore and what needed to be done. And that was the time the environment, atmosphere in Pune was really charged. We were blessed to have so many philosophers like Principal Gharpure, uh, Professor Jaikar, uh, N.C. Kekar, Professor Bhandarkar, Mahamohopadhyay, Dattobaman, Poddar, and so on and so forth. They were all luminaries, they were all scientists who were driven by the fact that we have to make our country a very strong nation. And if at all we did, needed to do that, then we needed to create the next generation which would be learned, which would be skilled, and which would cater to the needs of our nation which would really do science for the society, which would make India a very powerful nation. So thinking about that, they form a committee of Professor Jaikar, uh, Dr. Dhananjay Gadgi, and they all came together and they started thinking uh, what exactly needed to be done. There were universities in India. The first university in India that way uh, since uh, was established in 1857, but not many of them contributed significantly to creation of uh, knowledge, barring maybe a few illustrious examples, and there were only a few. So we needed to create research institute or academic institute which would cater to the need of education as well as research. And that was something that was in the mind of the committee. And that was the time when a visionary and eminent botanist, Dr. Professor Shankar Purushottam Magharkar, who had retired from University of Calcutta, who had also completed his tenure as president of ISCS, was, had shifted to Maharashtra and he was thinking of starting an institution on the lines of ISCS or Indian Association for Cultivation of Science. Now, Indian Association for Cultivation of Science had its own place in the history in Indian science. 
in pre-independent India, almost all those scientists who had contributed significantly in one way or other were associated with ISCS. Let it be uh, Prof Professor C. V. Raman, let it be Humi Bhabha for short change, Acharya Basu, all of them, they were associated with Indian Association for Cultivation of Sciences, who were creating knowledgeable students, but who were also actively involved in the research. Something on that line, Professor Agharkar had in his mind to start in, uh, in Maharashtra. Now, when this idea was put before the committee, immediately Principal Gharpure offered him uh, some space in law college. He said that you can start the institute here immediately. And that is how the concept of Maharashtra Association for Cultivation of Science was established. And this institute was established on 5th October 1946 as association in Pune. And this started in the basement of law college. And Indian Law Society was really gracious in offering this space. And uh, this institute was initially established as a society, later on as a trust, because if you had to carry research, you needed money, and there was no funding. Almost all the funds were invested by Professor Agharkar from his own resources and through generous donations, such as Maharani of uh, Baroda, Chimnabai Gayakwad, and likes. So, if at all it was to be done, then there had to be some aims and objectives defined, and they were, at that time, the promotion of science, including its practical application to the problem of national welfare, maintaining institutes for scientific research, establishing science library, and disseminating knowledge of pure and applied sciences through lectures, publications, demonstrations, exhibition, etc. In short, they were interested in science for the society. And when this institute was established, obviously, unanimously, Professor S.P. Agarkar was elected as his founder director. The great visionary, he started his work. And he was a man not only of words, but was of action. He worked in the field. He gathered along with him equally driven scientists who were ready to work without any remuneration. And these scientists included Professor N.V. Zoshi, who established microbiology and biochemistry department, Professor Azrekar, who organized mycology department, Professor uh, Devaras, who started uh, the investigations in zoology, and Professor Agarkar himself established botany and soil science departments. This is how the institute started. Later on, Professor G.B. Devdikar, who played a very important role in this institute, also joined. He attracted many students to this institute. What was interesting to note that it was the time when not even NCL was established. We didn't even have Pune University at that time. There was a research laboratory, but that laboratory was not fully established as such. And that was the time when the concept was conceptualized by Professor Agarkar, and he started working towards it. They carried out some work together with Professor Principal Gharpure and Professor Jaikar, and Pune University was established in 1948. And as a part of this Pune University, the Agharka Research Institute was granted recognition in the field of botany, cytogenetics, plant breeding, entomology, zoology, mycology, microbiology, chemistry, and agricultural chemistry. And this was how the institute started. Obviously, we needed students when they came to know that there were scientists and researchers who were working, who were actually working with their hands, who were soiling their shoes and clothes by doing the field work. They were all attracted, and that is how the institute started flourishing. Later on, 1960, uh, on 2nd of September, Professor S.P. Agharkar, he passed away. Now, when he passed away, his wife, she... <coughs> donated whatever belongings they had to the institute, and that is how the sacrifice of the family who rose above the normals, they actually resulted in growth of this particular institute. The, at that time, the executive committee chairman, Dr. Raghunath Paranspe, he appointed uh, Dr. G.B. Devdikar as a director, and he again gave a lot of directions. He was one of the main uh, scientists who was involved in establishing the plant breeding program at Agarka Research Institute. Later on, the ministry, uh, they, later on, the thing started changing. Indian Law Society was growing. They required more space. Obviously, they needed space, so Agarka Research Institute had to make the space available. 
For some time, Gokhale Institute had offered the place, but that was something which was not really good for the research institute. And obviously, Professor Devdikar and others, they approached then Chief Minister of Maharashtra, Shri Y.B. Chavan, Yashwant Rao Chavan, who graciously offered us this particular land, approximately of five acres of land to the institute. And that is how this land was given to MSCS, the Maharashtra Association for Cultivation of Science, and also an ad hoc grant of six lakhs rupees was given to build the research institute. And that is how this beautiful building of Agarka Research Institute was constructed in 1960s. And that was just the beginning. Then looking at whatever efforts were taken, Ministry of Education undertook this particular institute under its aegis. And 1972, when the Department of Science and Technology was already established in 1966, in 1972, Agarka Research Institute was one of the first autonomous institute which was adopted by Department of Science and Technology. And after that, Agarka Research Institute started working. Just to give you an idea, this was the expenditure or budget in early days of Agarka Research Institute. You will see that 18,000, 9,000, 13,000, 12,000, this is a meager amount. But we have to understand that in those days, this was a huge amount, considering the fact that almost everything was coming from the pocket of SP Agarkar, sir. And that speaks volume, how he single-handedly drove this institute and research at this particular institute. Later on, as Ministry of Education undertook this institute and started giving them grant, the funding research grant started increasing. And later on, 1972 onwards, then Department of Science and Technology, they started giving us funding and we started growing. Initially, there were programs, then there were departments. And soon we had botany, chemistry, genetics and plant breeding, geology, microbiology, zoology, quantitative biology, which later on became biometry and nutrition department, as well as then certain other uh, auxiliary departments such as library, administration unit, instrumentation units, etc. All these departments where they came into existence. This is how institute was growing. We have continued this growth. We have continued this theme. What is our theme? Theme is science for society. And keeping that in mind, we have organized our research program. We have organized our research program on six thematic areas, which include biodiversity and paleobiology, bioenergy, bioprospecting, developmental biology, genetics and plant breeding, and nanobiosciences. Why we chose these areas? There was a history behind that. There is an integral connect in all these programs. Professor Agharkar, he was a great observationist. He was also a great morphologist. What he did was something interesting. He was botanist by training. But when he was moving, uh, when he was visiting River Ganges, he saw a jellyfish in the fresh water of River Ganges. Now that was something which was really very extraordinary because in those days, there was a strong belief that jellyfish is found only in marine environment. Now this is something, a fresh water, uh, jellyfish, uh, morphologically different, probably a new species, he investigated it. Not only he investigated it, this was such an important finding that it got published in Nature. Now that was something which is very important. So we have picked up this. He was interested in biodiversity. Our institute has continued our work in the area of biodiversity. And it is just not the textbook kind of research. We do biodiversity with purpose. We knew that India was a very strong nation historically. Why? Because we were blessed with tremendous natural resources. Unfortunately, these natural resources were plundered by the Western countries. Why? Because we did not believe in documentation. Many of the things which were known to us were not properly documented. And as a result, you would see that many of the Western countries took patents on the products which were known here for ages together, and we were prevented from using those products. So obviously, that is something that we don't want, we don't accept, and we have to start documenting. So the uh, biodiversity research in our institute is driven by the purpose that we want to catalog especially any new plant varieties, any microbial varieties, any varieties of fungi, lichens, etc. If there is a new species, we want to document it. And when we are documenting, obviously it is not possible for us to cover the entire nation, but we have identified the biodiversity hotspot of Western Ghats and Northeastern Himalaya. And in that, we have been carrying out our investigation to report new species, 
to catalog the diversity associated with these biodiversity hotspots. Not only that, during this investigation, if at all we find that there are certain species which are endangered species, obviously our scientists take efforts to come up with something that can conserve these endangered species. So this is the one such example which is of Seropagia, which is very difficult, which was endangered, medicinally an important plant. Our scientists have taken efforts to come up with tissue culture technique, to cultivate them on mass, to replicate them in the laboratory, and then later on reintroduce them in the, uh, in the field as such, to again conserve them. There are certain other examples of orchids and several other plants, but this is just one such example. And we don't restrict ourselves to conservation of only endangered species. If at all there are certain habitats, then those habitats also reconstructed, conserved, and that is how we have been doing that. While doing such investigation, we generate a lot of knowledge. We don't want to restrict that knowledge. We want to keep that knowledge available to everyone. And that is how we have created a database of medicinally important plant. This uh, particular investigation was supported by, supported by RGSTC, and where this particular database of medicinal plant is being accessed and used by several industries, especially in the field of herbal medicines. We also offer drug authentication services because we have the reference material, which very few other institutes have it. So any industry, when they are coming up with the herbal products, if at all they want to authenticate their drugs, they approach us, and we have a very well-established laboratory and procedure by which we do that. There are certain bioactive molecules which are being investigated and which are being used for the purpose of finding treatments against diseases, especially the non-communicable diseases, and of course the flora, whatever we are gathering information on is documented in the form of various books, published articles, and everything. So that is how we are driven with a purpose to carry out research. It is not only restricted to, I would say, uh, microorganisms and plant. We take natural resources very seriously, and these natural resources are to be cultivated. One such natural resources is so many varieties of crop that we have, for example, wheat and soya bean. So our scientists, who are very great experts in plant breeding, they have, been, they have adopted the conventional cross-breeding techniques to come up with newer varieties. Why newer varieties? Because these newer varieties are having some interesting characteristics. They are more productive, they are resistant to diseases, they are tolerant to the stress, both biotic as well as abiotic stress. And many of these varieties are also biofortified varieties. So far, our institute has come up with 12 such varieties of wheat, 11 varieties of soya bean, which have been released, which have been used for various uh, applications, which are used for peninsular India, central India, and certain other basins. What is very interesting about many of these varieties, or some of these varieties are, they are biofortified varieties where they provide the trace element uh, which is required by children, especially in the form of zinc, iron, protein content, etc. And these varieties are available. And these varieties, we also have certain other varieties. You want to make paste, pa pasta, we have certain variety. Puran Poli, we have a special variety. Bread making, we have certain varieties. So there are different varieties which have been developed by our scientists and which have become very popular. Some of these varieties, especially biofortified varieties last year, were released and mentioned by Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji in his, uh, when he released certain varieties, biofortified varieties. Our scientists have also been actively involved in interacting with the farmers. They have developed and written certain books, certain leaflets, which actually talk about very interesting uh, practices which one needs to adopt in the field. And why these practices are needed to be adopted in the field is because they can improve your yield, especially when the irrigation is not easily available. Our agricultural system even today is based on the rain-fed agricultural system. The vagaries of nature can really be very detrimental to the agricultural practices. But our scientists have come up with certain varieties and certain practices which they talk to the farmers, which they cater to the need of the farmer, they educate them, and you would see that with a minimal investment, they are getting rich or reaping richer benefits which are, which, which are really in the interest of the farmers. And some of such examples I have listed here where in field we are getting 15% and 30% incremental yield over what we are what the farmers were getting. 
Not only that, whenever we have introduced high productive varieties, we claim that around 12 uh, quintal or 10 quintals of uh, yield you would be getting per acres. But this is something which our scientists believe in underestimating themselves. Farmers who have used our varieties and practices in the field have gone up to 16 quintals of the yield and which has been really appreciated by government of Maharashtra and such uh, efforts were felicitated by Honorable Chief Minister of Maharashtra. So when we get this, we also have all inclusive you know, approach. So now you have the agriculture, and agriculture after harvesting grains, it also generates certain residue. What do you do with residues? We hear that farmers, they tend to burn these residues, which would result in some kind of pollution. Our scientists do not believe in that. We believe that this particular agricultural waste or residue that is generated can be used. There is a lot of energy there, and that energy needs to be extracted. So our scientists have developed developed a kind of biorefinery approach. And you would see that in this particular approach, what our scientists are doing. We have the agricultural residues. These agricultural residues, we use certain microorganisms, which would degrade these agricultural residues very efficiently without any thermochemical pretreatment, convert it into something like ethanol or hydrogen or methane. Each of them will act in its own uh, capacity as a biofuel, and it can be used as an alternative to conventional fossil fuel. It will reduce pollution, it would extract energy, and which can be a sustainable energy. We are very proud to say that for energy, the technology that we had established here for the production of hydrogen has been adopted by KPIT Technologies Limited, while the technology for methane production without any thermochemical pretreatment will be adopted by GPS Renewables. And today only we will be signing an agreement with GPS Renewable in the afternoon for commercialization of this particular process. Whatever product that comes out of such digestion. There is a slurry. We use that slurry, and we can convert it into compost or organic manure, and people can use it. There is a liquid digest which comes, we can, or gas that comes out, CO2 that can be used by algae, and these algae can be grown, and they can be used either as a source of lipids to perform a biodiesel, or this CO2 can also be used for their cultivation as a single cell protein. Methane, which is grown, we can reform it into hydrogen, use it. We can convert it into bio CNG and use it. We can convert it into electricity and use it. Or we can valorize by converting it into some of the value added products such as methanol or pigment or single cell proteins using methanotrops, and that also can be using. So the moral of the story is our scientists believe in creating a complete story and cater to the need of uh, environment and society, come up with the methods which will abate pollution facilitate energy recovery, and contribute to the growth of our nation. We also have another department. Time is changing. There are newer areas of research which are coming up. Newer tools are becoming available. So our scientists are also adopting. Nanobiosciences is one such technology or one such field which has been adopted by our scientists. And our scientists have come up with rapid diagnostic tools in the form of lateral flow assay, or they can be used for diagnosis of some of the viral pathogen. They can be also used for detection of ochrotoxin. Now, ochrotoxin is another interesting one. Whenever you have to export any of the commodities, that commodity should be certified to be free from uh, ochrotoxin. Uh, when or aflatoxins. Now, when you have such kind of spices or commodities which are to be exported, and when aflatoxin is to be estimated, you have to resort to techniques such as ICPMS or LCMS, which are very expensive techniques. Our scientists have come up with the process by which you can detect it by simply dot blot assay or lateral flow assay in very minute quantities, and it can be done even at the point of use. And that is something which is really beautiful about this particular research. Also, another research is the practice that developed by our scientists to synthesize quantum dots in the laboratory, which can be used as a substitute to expensive chromophores, which are used in some of the state-of-the-art techniques or uh, in-situ hybridizations or uh, for such kind of labeling assays in the research. And these quantum dots could be effective. Similarly, SI RNA are being used as nanomedicine. I will not go into details of each of them, but that is something which indicates the changing times at Agarka Research Institute. 
it's not that we are working only in the applied research. There are certain basic research that we have to always not neglect, but we should always address to. And uh, we have a group of brilliant scientists in developmental biology group who are involved in using animal models to answer some of the questions. One of such examples I will just pick up very quickly is the work on uh, the zebra fish where one of our scientists has been working on heart regeneration as well as regeneration of the cartilaginous uh, material. What he has found out is there is a protein which is CCN2 protein which can uh, recover the muscles which are injured following heart attack. Now these particular muscles usually will mean that that particular part of the heart is dead and the heart will not be functioning, its efficiency will be reduced. But after regeneration of such tissues, the heart can recover its ability to work like a normal one. And the CCN2 protein has shown in zebrafish model that it can be very effectively used for such particular purpose. In zebra, it has an analog in humans. Can we use it? Only time will tell. But what is important to note here is there are several other uh, aspects of developmental biology with respect to reproduction and others, and that is something that is being addressed very aptly by our scientists in developmental biology group. So all in all, when I'm standing here on this particular occasion, I have to take uh, stock of what, how exactly our institute is performing. And we can always talk about several contributions and it's very difficult to like uh, review and cite all the contribution made by all the scientists. But I would say that we are a very small institute, but we have been making some impact. So I would just enlist our achievement in the form that is considered as a deliverables. Our scientists have been publishing papers in journals of high international repute, and this is something which is a certification of their research by the peers in the field. They have been filing patents, they have been getting patents, which is again a very good indication that whatever intellectual property generated is not remaining in the book, but it is being protected. The technologies are transferred to the industries, that means whatever research is generated in the laboratory is translated in the field. We are releasing improved crop varieties, state-of-the-art infrastructure is being established. We are disseminating knowledge to the society. And whenever there is any challenge or calamity faced by our nation, we are always rising to the challenge. And contribution to our fight against COVID-19, where we contributed to the testing, we contributed to the awareness, we contributed even to the origin of uh, the COVID-19 virus, where Dr. Rahalkar has been uh, quite frequently figuring on uh, televisions and newspaper. So that is something that we have been doing every now and then. We have published 77 papers in last year, book chapters are there. But what I would like to specially mention here is achievements and recognition that our scientists have been getting. One of our scientists, Dr. Virendra Gajbie, has for the second year in row been identified among the top 2% of the scientists in the world by Stanford University. And that I believe is something that speaks volume about the quality of the research which is done. Even at very young age, whatever achievements that have been done by some of our scientists in biodiversity department, Dr. Karthik Balasubramaniam and Dr. Ritesh Kumar Choudhury has already been recognized. They are relatively very early in their career, but at such young age, their recognition, their contribution is recognized by national academies and foundations, and that is something which is very important. And very fondly, I must mention here about Dr. Uh, about Snehal Jamalpure. She is yet to become doctor, I guess. But uh, Snehal Jamalpure is our student. Uh, we have been inculcating the entrepreneurial culture amongst our students. We want to give them training. We want to encourage them to take research from the laboratory to the field, be employer rather than being employee. So that is something that we want them to do. So we are always encouraging our student. What is important is student grasps something and they always surprise us how exceedingly they do well. And Snehal Jamalpure, she had also contributed in the National Bioentrepreneurship uh, Championship uh, competition. 
which was held in Bangalore, and uh, she won the first prize there, and it was worth uh, one lakh rupees, and also some grant and further uh, pathway for commercialization of our technology. That is something that we believe uh, is a very significant achievement by our students. Of course, it is not restricted to this. There are other students who have been doing exceedingly well. DST Ausar Award was won by our students, and there were several other awards and winners. What is important is we are creating knowledge base, we are creating human resources. There are 11 students who have already obtained their PhDs. Whatever technologies we are, developed, we are developing in the lab, we are again translating them in the field. Uh, we have been working not only with KPIT Limited or GPS Renewable, but we are also working with ONGC. And ONGC has recently signed an agreement with us to come up with a process which is actually we already have proof of concept but translate it, translate that process into commercially viable technology and we have signed an agreement with ONGC for mitigation of microbial induced corrosion caused by sulfate reducing bacteria and there are several other MOUs that we have been signing. Not only that, we have created certain repositories. These repositories in the form of uh, National Fungal Culture Collection, uh, Agarkar Herbarium, Mycological Herbarium, so on and so forth. These repositories are serving as a resource for academicians, for students, as well as for industries. We have a great uh, variety of reference material which are being used by people uh, all across the country and even from abroad. They are visiting our facilities and they are using our repositories. In addition to that, we are actively involved in the infrastructure development. Gone are the days when we used to work in a small laboratory and with a relatively primitive microscope. These days, students, they work like this. I really hope that they are doing fantastic research and making the best possible use of the facilities. Just in last one year, we came up with uh, some more modernization of our infrastructure, which I'm sure is going to benefit our research. It's going to improve further the quality of research being carried out at our institute. Whatever infrastructure, facilities, services, expertise we have, we are always making it available for the use of society, and it is being extensively used by society, both academia, industries, colleges, students, professionals, everybody. It is open for everyone at nominal charges, and they are being used, and this is just a list of this. So all in all, I would just take a look at glance of last one year. We are 30 scientists. We have 66 extramural sponsored projects. We have received the DST grant of 39 crores for the last year, which is now increased to 48 crores, which is approved grant. Uh, we have 77 publications in SCI journals, six patent files, two patent granted, two technologies transferred and licensed, and one more I hope will be done uh, today in the afternoon. And there are 11 PhD students, and we have done a significant sample testing for COVID lab. This is all possible only because of the scientists and students who have been working tirelessly in our institute. It is also possible only because of the generous support that we have been getting from Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, and we are eternally indebted to them. And not only to DST, but also to ICR, SCRB, DBT, ONGC, KPIT, HTBL, GPS, Renewables, and so on and so forth. There are several others who have been giving generous support to us. I must also make special mention of the guidance that we have been receiving from the Institute Council, as well as governing body of Agarka Research Institute. And without their guidance, it would not be possible to reach where we have reached today. I must acknowledge the efforts of my fellow scientists, staff, students of our institute. They have been efficient, diligent, cooperative, and with the help of their support, we look forward to continuing to serve the nation, collaborating with industry and academia, and working for the benefit of society. I thank you all for patient hearing. Thank you so much. God bless.